Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Woodrow Wilson, and the focus is crises, international and personal. The year is 1913. Woodrow Wilson, for a long time, had been one of his country's foremost experts on governments from around the world all those years as a PhD political scientist, but he'd actually had no hands-on experience in foreign affairs before becoming president. Well, that's the job he has right now, and right out of the gate, he has a crisis on his hands on his southern border. Over the last couple of years of the Taft administration, there'd been an ongoing revolution in Mexico, where Francisco Madero had ousted the longtime president of Mexico, Porfirio Diaz. But things were still pretty unstable. So just about a month before Wilson took his oath of office in the United States, there was a coup in Mexico. General Victoriano Huerta had actually had Madero arrested and executed, and Huerta put himself in as president of Mexico. Well, Wilson came in, had to figure out what to do in terms of relations with Mexico. The British had supported Huerta, and they were pushing other countries to try to recognize the Huerta government. But Woodrow Wilson wasn't ready to do that. He thought this was undemocratic. There was a problem. And in fact, he had heard that the American ambassador, Henry Wilson, might have actually been involved in the coup. So he decided to send his own envoy, William, um, William Hale, to go investigate. Hale went to Mexico, came back, reported back to the president that it basically was true. The American ambassador, Henry Wilson, was involved in this coup. In fact, a lot of people in Mexico were blaming the Americans for the whole thing. Well, Wilson immediately recalled his ambassador, but then he actually took things a step further. He wrote a letter to Huerta recommending that he step down and hold free and fair elections in Mexico. Well, Huerta wasn't going to do this. He had already installed himself as president. He wasn't going to make that change. There were debates in the cabinet. In fact, the Secretary of War, Lindley Garrison, was recommending an invasion to go oust Huerta. But again, Wilson wasn't going to go there either. He adopted a policy called watchful waiting. Fast forward about a year, April 1914, still unrest in Mexico, and the American naval vessel, the USS Dolphin, was in Tampico, the port, in the port of Tampico, kind of a routine mission picking up supplies in Mexico, where some Mexican soldiers came to the ship and they asked to see the papers of the American sailors. They found some of them were not quite in order and they had these men arrested. Well, they brought them into town of Tampico. All of a sudden, the leaders in the Mexican military said, this is probably not a very good idea. They let the American sailors go. There was an apology issued from the, from the government of Mexico, but this wasn't enough for the commanding admiral in the area. And his name was Henry Mayo. And Henry Mayo wanted more of an apology, a military apology, a 21-gun salute to take place in front of the dolphin. And at this, President Huerta said no. Now we've got a bit of a standoff because Wilson was backing, American President Wilson was backing his Admiral Mayo. Huerta saying no for 11 kind of tense days, no action. And Wilson then went to the U.S. Congress and basically said, point of pride for the United States, if they didn't get that 21-gun salute, they might have to resort to arms. Well, the very next day, things changed a little bit. Again, there was a phone call kind of in the middle of the night where Wilson was on the phone with his personal secretary, Joe Tumulty. He had Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan and the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels, on the phone. They were providing information to the president that the Germans had just sent a thousand small arms to the Mexicans. It had gotten into the uh, custom house at Veracruz, the major port city on the eastern side of Mexico. And there was a lot of panic now in the United States that maybe this, these arms could be used against American soldiers and sailors. And President Wilson on the spot ordered the Navy to go in and capture Veracruz, which is what they did starting that next day. This was not an easy fight. It was bloody. 19 Americans were killed, 70 others wounded, 126 Mexicans were killed as well. It was no decision to go to war at this point, but things certainly were very tense. But the Americans actually now had some leverage over the Huerta government because they controlled the most significant port for all of Mexico in Veracruz. And if they could choke that port, have nothing coming through, well, that was going to hurt the American people. And that's what happened over the next couple of months. A lot more pressure on the Huerta government to the point where in July, Huerta actually abdicated. He left Mexico, went to get refuge in Spain. The question was who was going to take over now? There was still turmoil, still kind of anybody's guess going on in Mexico going forward. But in the meantime, there was also chaos going on in Europe. Just a couple of months before, President Wilson had sent Colonel Edward House 
to Europe kind of as his personal envoy to meet with the leaders in Britain and France and Germany and kind of get a sense of some of the grumblings going on and potentially going to have some fights on their hands. And Colonel House reported back some pretty scary stuff. He told the President of the United States the situation is extraordinary. It is militarism run stark mad. Unless someone acting for you could bring about a different understanding, there is some day to be an awful cataclysm. No one in Europe can do it. There is so much hatred, too many jealousies. Well, things exploded on June the 28th. That's when a Bosnian Serb assassinated the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir apparent to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And there were all these bilateral security deals in Europe that basically created World War I. You've got Austria now uh, uh, declaring war against Serbia. Because there was a Russian pact with Serbia to mutual defense, that meant the Russians had to declare war on Austria. Germany had an agreement to support Austria, so they declared war on the Russians. The French were to support the Russians. They declared declared war on Germany, England supporting France, also declaring war, and just like that, World War I. Where do the Americans stand? At this point, neutral. This had been the tradition of the United States going back to the George Washington administration, the very beginning of the country. Stay out of European conflicts. Remain neutral whenever they're going on. And that's what Woodrow Wilson decided to do, at least at this stage of the war. And he felt this is where the American people were. They had no real personal interest or self-interest for the United States to get involved in this conflict, at least at this time. And Wilson felt he was on firm ground to stay with that public opinion and stay out of this European war, at least for the time being. Besides, Woodrow Wilson had a more pressing problem, much closer to home. His wife, Ellen Wilson, was sick. She had been suffering from fatigue and other maladies for weeks, and things were getting worse. And so Dr. Kerry Grayson, who was Wilson's physician while he was president, decided to bring in some specialists. And they finally had a diagnosis, and it wasn't good. Bright's disease. Bright's disease, kind of a catch-all term for diseases of the liver, almost always fatal. When they heard this news, Wilson's daughters saw their father cry for the very first time. Now, Wilson barely left his wife's side through this, this really tense period, but deaths were mounting over in Europe, and it appeared that Edith Wilson, oh, excuse me, Ellen Wilson was about to join them. And on August 6th, she had basically accepted her fate. She told Kerry Grayson, the doctor, promise me that when I go, you will take care of Woodrow. And his wife of 29 years actually passed away that very day. Wilson himself, the president, was devastated. He wrote a letter to Mary Peck. He said, God has stricken me almost beyond what I can bear. There was a funeral in the East Room of the White House before the train took the body and casket to Rome, Georgia. That was Ellen Wilson's hometown for the burial. He was by her body's side that entire time, tears flowing the entire time, basically inconsolable. But he's also president of the United States and not a lot of time to mourn over personal tragedies when the world is basically fracturing. The Germans were blitzing through Belgium on the west side to get to France. They were heading east to get into Russia. In the meantime, there's also an election going on in the United States, the midterm elections. And Woodrow Wilson was being praised by some and being attacked by others. Part of the country wanted to stay out, therefore neutrality. Others, being led by former President Theodore Roosevelt, were attacking Wilson. They thought at least Americans should be preparing for war, if not getting into the war. In the end, the people spoke, and the Democrats suffered a, a, some losses in the midterm elections. It wasn't catastrophic, but their majority certainly came down. Well, meantime, though, Woodrow Wilson was still staying neutral. Well, all of this pressure, all of this difficulty for Wilson is not a surprise that he actually blew his top at one point. Now, Wilson was normally very, very calm. He rarely lost it, but he did in a meeting in December of 1914 with William Trotter, who was a civil rights advocate who went to the White House to complain about the segregation of blacks in a couple of federal agencies by the President Wilson. In fact, William Trotter said that you said to Wilson that your colored fellow citizens could depend upon you for everything, which would assist in advancing the interests of the race in the United States. But then Trotter asked Wilson whether there was a new freedom for white Americans and a new slavery for your Afro-American fellow citizens. Well, after a long diatribe, this was enough. This sent Wilson over the top, and he responded to, to Trotter and said, your tone, sir, offends me. You were the only American citizen that has ever come into this office who has talked to me with a tone of passion that was evident. Now, I want to say that if this association comes again, it 
must have another spokesman. Well, Trotter went public with this, the way he had been rebuked. The press, both white press and black press, a lot of them condemning Wilson for the racist policies that he had put in place in the administration. But Wilson continued to be unmoved. He continued to believe that segregating these federal agencies was not harmful to blacks. He thought it was helpful to them, actually, to give them some mobility upward in the black-only parts of the organization. He would continue those racist policies through the rest of his administration. Back in Europe, trench warfare driving the casualty count higher and higher, and the Americans, while staying neutral, were still affected by this, principally economically. The money men in the United States were very jittery over this. In fact, Wall Street closed four and a half months, the longest period in American history when that stock exchange had shut down. There was also, though, economic opportunity for the Americans because the belligerents overseas needed uh, products, they needed goods, and the Americans had them to send. The problem was they didn't have enough shipping. Usually, the Americans would ship goods to Europe on European vessels. There just wasn't enough American vessels to send all these goods. So the Treasury Secretary, William McAdoo, came up with an idea to have what he called a SHERP ship purchase bill, where the government would pay to rapidly build ships that could then carry all of these products. It would be good for the American economy. The problem is Congress balked. There were some in Congress who thought this might violate the neutrality piece for the, for the United States if they got too heavily involved, perhaps in one side versus the other. And they were also kind of reeked of socialism, which of course was anathema to many in the United States if the American government was going to be own, you know, purchasing and owning these ships. So this was not something that Wilson and the administration were able to get through Congress. They would continue, in, just like in Mexico, with watchful waiting, and still with Europe watchful waiting, and they would ship basically whatever they could trying to figure out, again, the long-term play of the foreign policy in terms of World War I. So a very difficult time for the president internationally and personally, but at least on the personal side, there was going to be some upside right around the corner. A woman named Edith Galt was about to enter the picture, but that's the story for another day. That is Woodrow Wilson and crises, international and personal, from the life of Woodrow Wilson. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicle.